Welcome to the Scottish Watches podcast. It's been a hell of a week here. Lots of cool things have happened. There's been many happy returns. The guys at Hodinkee have come back with a bang. They've got John Mayer, Ed Sheeran, producing an amazing video that you should check out if you haven't already. There's been a field of dreams for Studio Underdog as their second album hits the shelves. We talked about that in our previous edition, but we couldn't really show you much because there was an embargo on the images. And Christopher Ward are doing a bit of a Beyonce with their Halo 12. Plus some releases from Tag, Rowing Blazers and Hanhart, if we get at the time but the first thing to talk about is watches and Hodinki do it best Dave would you not agree I guess they are one of the uh reasonable ones what shall we say I guess things have changed with them over the time and everyone's got their own opinion of it but yeah when they do it well they do it very well we're all a bit been happy in this show I'm trying to spread goodwill as we approach the festive period and I will say good things about Hodinki when Hodinki do good things travel clocks perhaps not fantastic videos yes indeed have you had the chance to have a look at this thing or will we just tell listeners and viewers to go and check it out themselves to be honest i watched a bit of it but then i was like no nah, nah i've had enough i just i'm not i'm not big into personally consuming that kind of content honestly but certainly plenty of folk have said they've watched it through and really enjoyed it some folk love watching content like that some folk less so i mean uh i guess that's the way it is but you're right the bit i saw certainly they got to talk about some interesting watches and they are two pretty heavy hitters when it comes to their watch collections obviously there's a little bit of me was like mm, what's the catch in this what's the catch why are they doing this what was the catch dave did you find out what the catch was do you think it was about a collaborator watch possibly that maybe um all the people involved might be wanting to sell. No, Hodinkee wouldn't do that. They haven't released over 60 limited edition watches in the past five or so years. Really? And do you think that maybe a guest on there wanted to release a watch in collaboration with them as well? Who would have thunk it? But hey, it is actually... I'm going to use the word attainable, attainable in price point. Whether it's attainable in actual availability, that might be a very different uh, conundrum when it eventually goes on sale. Would this be a mellow yellow edition of the 6900 series, perhaps, with a kind of black graffiti style on the yellow strap? I'm going to go on the basis that it's a, it's a G-Shock that is probably going to cost twice what it would cost you to get one that wasn't collaborative, or maybe a bit more, but will still be relatively good value in the wider world of watches. That was a bit of a tongue twister. Well, well, no, I can't even say it again now. The wider world of watches? Possibly. Purple burglar alarm. Not saying it. I'm going to be the one that's not the curmudgeon on the show this week. Usually Dave is the upbeat guy at the start of the show. He's full of beans. He wasn't full of beans when he was recording at Arage. He, his parole hearing did not go well. He has gone down for another 69 years. But we're here today to be full of fun and frolics. And I actually really like this Ed Sheeran edition. So when it does go on sale, I think it's about $189. I might look into getting one because I love G-Shocks. I don't believe I have a yellow one. There is a yellow one within the household, a Cassie Oak that was purchased for a Christmas gift. But we also get the opportunity to catch up with the folks from G-Shock because they paid us a visit in Scotland. Everything G-Shock kind of lined itself up this week or this week stroke last week where we had a little bit of a soiree with James Porter's son who had a bit of a, certainly a UK exclusive in as much as there is an all new MRG, so the very high end of G-Shock, certainly the less affordable end, shall we say. They were launching an anniversary piece. Um, if I get it right, I think it's maybe the 40 it was an anniversary watch to talk about G-Shock and Casio as a company and this was one of their dive watches and I think it might be the first time they've done an MRG in the Frogman series and it's pretty impressive to be honest albeit better part of five and a half thousand pounds but they were the first place that was showing this off anywhere in the UK and I believe they're going to be the only place to get it outside of either G-Shock's website or G-Shock's boutique in London in the UK as well. So it was really nice to be part of that. Uh, really pleased for Porters because they've again supported G-Shock and MRG since they were pretty much available in the UK. So again, nice to see, I guess that smaller independent retailer getting supported by one of the big boys. So yeah, went along. There was a good number of people there, real kind of wide mix, folk we know, some folk we don't know, and uh, had a, a real fun time. I think they had three or four staff, I think it was, from uh, G-Shock that were up to show these watches off and, you know, alongside Porter's already pretty extensive range of more unusual G-Shock pieces. Those guys brought a few interesting pieces up with them as well. And uh, it has to be said, the goodie bag for this uh, event was one of the more pristine 
precious goodie bags that have been ever given where we got the brand new G-Shock um, kind of hardback book that they've just announced as well. So that was a lovely little um, addition to an event as well. So thank you to Porters and to the guys at G-Shock. Yes, I shall model carefully on the desk the G-Shock book that you talk about here. This is really cool. I've got a lot of different books that you can't really see. They're in the background there on the video. You can see in the show notes. But when I got home and I checked out this Bible of G-Shocks, it covers everything from the very early days, like you say, 40 years ago, the Casio history going back 50 years, all the heavy hitters that have come out across the range, the 5000 series of Full Metal, the... Cassie Oak, as it was called, the 2100 series and beyond. So it was good to get a goodie bag that actually had goodies in it because some of the events that we've been to, you get nothing. You get a pen, you get a baseball cap and nothing much else for your travels. This is pretty funky. This will look great in the set here in the studio. And if you want to see some pictures of what is inside this, because you can actually buy it, there is a price on the back. It's about 50 quid. And for something that is this thick, 50 quid is actually fairly inexpensive. You're usually a couple hundred quid for something like this. And like you say, it was good to actually speak to the folks from Casio G-Shock themselves. I always had questions in my head. Why is it that the MRGs, the MTGs are so expensive? And it took a little bit of explaining because there was a lot behind the scenes. The modules are generally the same as you'd find in the lesser expensive models, but it all comes down to the case construction, the finishing, and the way that everything is put together. I am no expert on this. My memory fails me all the time. So hopefully we can convince those guys to come onto the show to tell you like it is. But the long and short of it would be to compare something like a Seiko to a Grand Seiko or a Credor, where you have machining on the less expensive models, factory assembly lines, things like that. But when it comes to the high end pieces, they're skillfully handcrafted and put together by people that actually know what they're talking about. And there was a little bit chat about the folks in Japan who worked on samurai swords now working on watches. Did you hear that part of the story? Yeah, there's been uh, quite a few, to be honest, MRGs over the last few years where they've tried to incorporate those traditional Japanese artisanal crafts, whether it's guys who make samurai blades, whether it's folk who do kind of traditional metalworking or any form of kind of traditional Japanese uh, artisanal crafts. And they've used those guys' techniques, whether it's on bezels or cases or bracelets, and, you know, kind of tried to bring those ancient crafts and ancient styles and handmade, hand-finished artisanal things into these kind of technologically advanced digital watches. Sarah was there from Bonham's Auctions. Obviously, I brought my good lady with me because she loves a G-Shock and her collection is growing rapidly. It was a great night. Good to chat to the folks. And the lasting takeaway that I had, again, about the price point would be if you look at a watch that has got a module in it or a movement and it's say a Salita or an Eta or even an NH35 and that module is 50 quid, 100 quid, something like that, that movement... And then you've got a case that's got a fantastic bezel, sapphire, finishing, bracelet, this, that and the other. And the watch costs around about five grand. Well, everything apart from the movement is the five grand. So that's something to bear in mind when it comes to the finishing and all the rest of it. If you like it, you can pay your money. If you don't like it, you can get something that's less expensive. And there are many in the G-Shock range. So fingers crossed, fingers crossed, Dave. We can hopefully get them onto the show to explain a little bit more about the history. Because I'm getting quite into it. I think the colourful, playful colours that have come out, the most recent addition to my collection was maybe two months ago there, and it was uh, an aqua marine, it's not turquoise, it was an aqua marine colour G-Shock in the style that is slightly newer looking, more futuristic looking than the Cassio 2100 series. But we should probably move on from G-Shock and tell everybody, if you're watching this on YouTube, we'd really appreciate if you subscribed to the channel, gave us a like and dropped in a comment. Let us know your thoughts, your criticisms, your feedback, positive, negative, we love it all and it improves the show on YouTube as well as the podcast. Remember to check the show notes. They are where you will find all the information on the watches that we're speaking about, all the pictures, all the links, all the tech spec. So we've had an email in inquiring about the uh, health and care of one of our contributors. So you should read this one out, Ricky. This came in a few weeks ago from Mark Jones, and he writes in to say, Hi guys, I was saddened to hear Ricky mentioned that Barbara Palumbo was unwell on Monday's show. I hope she is recovering and will be back in full health soon. Please pass on my best wishes. With thanks, Mark Jones. And I did 
past that messy drawing, Barbara is doing a lot better. For anyone that doesn't know, Barbara had uh, an ailment with her eyes. If you're on her social media follower, you probably would have seen what had been going on there. It is slowly getting better, but it made her unable to travel. She was hoping to come to Scotland for the first time to come to Global Red Bar. That didn't happen. She was playing it safe under physician's orders, but things, fingers crossed, are well on the mend and she will be working her way towards Dubai where she'll catch up with myself and Dave in a few weeks' time. Now, should we do that wrist check thing that we keep forgetting to do, Dave? Yep, you're going first. Am I really? Well, for anybody that has already spotted what I have on the wrist, I have got one of my favourite loner watches of the year. This is a release that we spoke about only a couple of weeks ago and it was air freighted straight across from the folks at Worn and Wound and Zodiac and this is their collaboration piece. So let me tell you all about it. This is a, an amazing collaboration. Sometimes brands get together and they just change the colour of the bezel, the dial, the strap. They put an engraving on the case back and Bob's your uncle out the door it goes and they hope to make a lot of money. <coughs> so anyway, on to this watch here. This is the Laser Tag Collection from Worn and Wound and Zodiac. Zodiac have been on the show a number of times in the past thanks to good friend Mike Pearson he is doing amazingly well with the brand he's only been there maybe 18 months approaching the two year mark but we have had him on our show a couple of times he has been on loads of other podcasts loads of other shows he's been in casual watch talk with Sam and Dave and Zodiac are just doing phenomenally good things look at this design we talked about it in depth so I'm not going to go over too much of the details but it is a super sea wolf it is limited edition there are only a handful available at the moment if you check the website so I would say if you like the look of this, go and grab it. I have not been out in any UV establishments, read into that what you will. Uh, my local gymnasium is not a lap dancing club as much as people on Instagram keep telling me it is. But I just absolutely love this. It, it's fantastic. I cannot say enough good things about it. I am gutted that this is going to have to go back across the pond to where it came from. But look at that, even on the case side profiles, there are loom plots included. So the full thing lights up like a 1980s video game. You'll have to check the show notes to see what I'm talking about here because this is well worth a look. Yep, if you like it, go grab it. The only negative, and you know me, Dave, I like to talk about the pluses and the negatives. If I take it off the rest, tell me if this sounds like guinea pigs having sex. That's uncannily like guinea pigs having sex. Thanks for that. What can I say? You know, I have to tell it like it is, Dave, and I'm going to ask you to tell it like it is with your wrist check. I am wearing a Citizen Alticron Cirrus. The white parts, as if you're watching YouTube, you'll be able to see, are ceramic with the rest in titanium and a bit like the watch that Ricky was wearing. It is full of the colours. So bright orange, bright green, bright yellow. This does a bit of everything, it has to be said, on an integrated rubber strap. Very comfortable to wear, as you would expect with it being a citizen. It is their eco technology, so it is run off of light. Yep, love it. Not had it on the wrist for quite a while, but owned this one for a good number of years. This was a little Japanese special, so that is what I am wearing. We should talk about a Halo product from Christopher Ward. Their 12 series, they released it recently in a 36mm size, which seemed to go down a storm. I thought it was a little bit too small when they actually sent us one to check out. I preferred the 40, and my <laughs> order actually came in. I'd placed an order a few months ago and due to the fact that these things sell out so quickly, as do most of the new Christopher Wards, like the Bel Cantos, no matter the colourways or the materials used in the casing, they just seem to fly out the door. But I got myself a 40mm one, but they're back and perhaps I should have waited because they have changed the bezel. A little bit like Tissot did with their PRX where they took a phenomenally successful watch and then a couple of years later they reiterated it with a rose gold bezel. The guys at Christopher Ward have done the same thing and they've kind of neutralised all the stuff on the dial, smoothed it out, given it a more, I would say, surgical look, a clean look to it. But that is not a negative. So what do you think of these new releases from the Halo range? I think this is quite clever. Maybe not personally my exact aesthetic, but for anyone who maybe felt that the 12 was a little bit too... I guess 1970s sports watch styled and wanted it to be softened down a little bit, then this 12 Halo I think very much does it. I'm sure it's slightly more 
feminine or dresses, maybe the way I'd describe it. Not saying it's a ladies' watch, but I reckon there'll be more ladies like this than maybe liked the previous iterations. The 36, I think, is the right size for this one. Quite dainty and quite kind of dress styled. I think the rose gold bezel, and it's a proper solid rose gold bezel on this as well, looks really good. Still got that kind of shape, but then the dial, they've gone super clean. They've gone for a kind of sanitised dial, really just with a tiny little bit of writing, that being the automatic and I believe the Swiss made. And then you've got the kind of logo in a rose gold applique style on there as well. But no battens, markers, printing or anything otherwise on the dial. Super clean, looks really good. Price point is an absolute cracker, around about £2,000, I believe, this one, and that's on the rubber, but it's also available on the bracelet. Really nice alternative at a much more accessible price to say something like a Girard Perigo Absolute Laureato, which is similar kind of vibe and feel to it, albeit at more like £15,000. So, you know, for a fraction of that, you can get something that's excellent quality with that same kind of 1970s classic dress feel to it as well. So, yeah, I think this is going to be a win. The last time we had the guys from Christopher Ward actually on the show to chat about things was a couple of months ago. And we got a little bit behind the scenes of how the watches are designed and put together. We actually get too much information. I'm quite good at extracting details from people that perhaps they should not tell us and we should not publish. But hey, that's how things happen here. And I believe we're actually going to have another one of the designers on in the next few weeks to talk about something else that we're not allowed to chat about right this second. We're all about embargoes not breaking them in this show. Hey, Rich. But this watch... I really like the look of it. They've taken a classic design, something that's been worked on for a couple of years because I know that behind the scenes, the folks at Christopher Ward had been designing this, had been on the drawing books for a while. It came out, massive success. Different size, massive success again. And they have brought out this different colourway, this different material. And some people asked about the price difference, the delta there between the non-precious bezel and the rose gold one. And it is exactly the same uplift in cost between the PRX with the bezel that is in gold and the PRX that has the steel bezel. So again, Christopher Ward, not milking it, not taking the piss out of the customers just because there's a precious metal involved. Some other brands are notorious that if there's even titanium involved, they put some extra zeros in the price tag. Definitely not the case with Christopher Ward. So have a look in the show notes if you want to see more details, more pictures, because it's a stunner. May not be for my wrist. I'm quite happy with my purchase. I have decided on that one. But this could be a winner for you. If, as Dave said, perhaps the previous one was just a little bit too ostentatious. That price delta, to give a bit of perspective to it, gold is around about $60 a gram at the moment. There's probably... 8 to 10 grams of gold in that bezel. So you're talking around $600 worth of gold just to buy the gold in that bezel. I think that probably justifies that five to six hundred pounds difference in the price of the non-precious metal bezel version and this one. And it's not just a case of switching things around because to work with gold because it is a more malleable substance, you need different tooling. Stainless steel seems to be quite easy. Everybody has it down to fine art how to work with it. But when it comes to gold and titanium and things like that, or platinum even, that's, that seems to be the worst. Gold is a whole different category. As you mentioned, it's got different specific density. It's a softer material. It's more malleable. And, you know, whether it's titanium, whether it's platinum, whether it's gold, whether it's different variations of gold, 9 carat, 18 carat, whatever those weights may be, all of them have a different skill set and tooling set that is involved in, in doing it. Now, moving on from Christopher Ward to a show report that includes a lot of different brands here in the UK. We have a whole host of contributors on our website. That's where the community side of the podcast lives, the articles, the news, the reviews, the previews. Opinion pieces, historical information from collectors that have been maybe collecting since their grandfather introduced them to watches. If this sounds like something you might like to get involved in, you might like to contribute, maybe an article for the website, or even help with the writer's team for producing posts for Instagram on new watches, collections or news, then get in touch. Don't DM us, drop us an email, info at scottishwatches.co.uk. But one of the guys that does help out is Robbie. And he has been on his travels. He's been across to see the folks at Nomos. And he was also down south recently when me and Dave were stuck in Spain at the Arrage event. A lot of things happened that weekend. We had the Festival of Time in Ireland that Johnny from the Watch Press put together. Pietro was there. Good article on our website about that. 
And obviously Robbie was down at Heathrow Terminal 5 for a fantastic event, which he's going to tell you about just now. Hi, Ricky. How's it going? It's Robbie here. I just want to update you on a couple of events that I've assisted in the last few months, just beginning with World Town UK, that it was held at Sofitel, Heathrow Terminal 5. It was a really good mix of independent and established brands. I spent the whole day over there chatting with friends, great location, and I got to see all those people that we always interact, whether it's on Instagram, WhatsApp. There was a lot of new brands around. And obviously the usual suspects, there are some really cool stuff that really caught my eye. Let's start with the Isotop Chronograph. I think that was a really standout for, for the event. Uh, it looks like nothing I've seen before. Very excited to see what the last iteration would be. And when it comes to the market, I think it will be a really good hit. It's always nice to see Jose and his team. I saw our friends from Formex, which have some really wild stuff that I cannot comment, but their comments are really, really good. Always impressed with their quality, materials, cases, everything looked really, really good. New dial variations and also good mixtures on their bracelet, good changes and really cool stuff. Always um, the quality is top notch, so really nice to see them. There was another brand that I saw and the three of them were uh, matched together with Vario. They brought their new GMT to market, uh, which included a new Miyota movement uh, with the independent jumping hour hand. That was uh, really good and I managed to spend some time with it. The guys of RCE also were their titanium offerings and really tough watches. And there was um, a watch brand from Taiwan, the brand called Havana Antuvali. He's making um, dials from paper, tobacco, you name it, and using all stock cases and movement from the 50. He re embellishes them and he does really cool work with them. Things that you wouldn't be able to see in, in a high street. So that was really cool to see. It's always a pleasure to see Doc or Presta. They, they, they had their new GMT, who everybody's talking about. Cases, nice finishes and great dials. Um, really happy to just go there and shake hands. Also, we had uh, very tough watches. And this has been a, a theme that has been going on through the, the whole event. Watches like Circula and Subdelta, they were really tough and well-constructed. On the field side and also aviation, but um, great materials. And in a price bracket that is really hard to mimic. Also from the UK, we saw the guys from Clemens and Gekota. They have really new things coming out, very hot stuff. We had a little bit of a hands-on with the Moor uh, that is coming out next week. Great field watch, 37 millimeter, looks good. The Gekota, they have their new divers that which we review. One thing that 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 I saw as well, there's there's a couple of good Italian brands like Eco Neutra, Venezianico, which uh, uh, been coming to the scene. It's really nice to see different nationalities and not, not only from the from one established region, but different parts of the world. In overall, it was a great event. So my second trip was to Nomos Glashütte. It was a real treat, I have to say. It all started very well. Took an early fly from Heathrow. Unfortunately, there's not that many flies directly to Dresden, so I have to stop in Munich. And it gave me time to explore. Obviously, as a fan, I wanted to go straight to Glashütte. We was 30 minutes from Dresden. They told me the museum's closed. There's no need for you to go there. We can go tomorrow when we're going to visit the manufacturing the chronometry atelier. So I decided to explore the city. Went to the city center, just a walk of three minutes. Beautiful city. Very Germanic looking, obviously. Stopped by Glashütte Original. They were really proud to show me everything on the boutique. Even the salesperson was showing me drawings and antique clocks that they have over there and the history of the brand. So they're really proud of, of the, the heritage. And I had to say those styles look, look amazing. Jump a little bit to Vampet to see the usual suspects. And of course, I took time to go to the Langensona Boutique. Gorgeous boutique, really big. They have the, the datograph from Ace IHH, which was uh, like two years ago. They had it. Now they have it on that store. For example, they had a corner where they had all the parts from one watchers. Just mind blowing. Really cool. And almost being normal, uh, I started to look at this trend and they came to pick us up in this Tesla because obviously the ESG initiatives that they currently have. So you could see this trend that everybody was trying to you know, help on this event. It was a really big thing for them and they acted as a family. Everybody was trying to help, which I thought it was really cool. Once we arrived to Glashütte, we went to the Atelier of Chrometry where they assembled the, uh, the watches and they tested, regulate them. Uh, and um, it was it was really impressive. I really, that, because of the building was old and very well maintained, but I was suspecting turn, uh, inside that it was going to be something similar. But it was completely state of the art, very modern technologies, benches, microscope, everything was like 
top notch. Then we move on to the manufacturer, which I thought it was going to be backwards. It would be nice to go to the manufacturer before the chroma tree. Once we, we got there, we started seeing all this machine, uh, all how, how the cases were machined and how all the parts were made, pinions, obviously bridges. So you can really start understanding how Nomos is such an integrated watch brand. Everybody was really nice to us, trying to show us how everything was made with lots of calm. And it's not easy to have around 10, 20 people just looking around what you're doing. The machines were very silent, which is something that I haven't experienced with other brands. Then we move on, obviously, to the novelties uh, in a place that's called a church, which was a church in the past. Um, and they show us all the novelties. Uh, I think overall, the trip was a very success. It really show us uh, the capabilities that they have as a, as a, as a watch powerhouse. Very interesting uh, trip. Um, hope to be back there next year. And yeah, hope you like it. This seems to be the episode where we're talking about collaborations. If it's not a G-Shock, it's a watch that is from Atelier Venn, which is a collaboration being done with Revolution Magazine. A little bit different here. This is a Chinese brand. And before anyone starts getting all upset about this, the Chinese are getting better and better at producing very high quality watches. And we've talked about a few of them in past episodes as well. So, Gioche Dio. And unlike an extremely high-end Swiss brand where we maybe commented that they used a stamped dial as opposed to a guilloche dial, these guys are using a proper, genuine, hand-turned guilloche dial in this watch. The dial for me is the star of the show. This is a brand that I don't know much about, but again, a writer's group were on the money with it maybe six months ago, and they have covered things. The design... I spoke to Dave offline and said it's very Pietro-esque, it's very the limited edition. It has a Sarpin Neva styling to it, it has got a Carrie Vitalainen styling, it's even got a Linda Verdlin styling to it. All the different parts mixed together and then the price point is actually very inexpensive for what you get. Revolution seemed to have taken up the mantle where Hodinkee used to be the collaboration, the limited edition masters. If you go to the Revolution website or to their Instagram or YouTube channel, they are just working with all these brands and it's an untapped market because they're not just coming in with the likes of Bulgari or Tag or big highfalutin companies like that they're selecting some of these independent guys and giving them the airspace that they deserve because it's not just the Swiss guys, it's not just the Germans it's not just even the British watchmakers the Chinese folks are getting it right you know, we've said that a million times before don't look down your nose at it don't think of cheap seagull movements and things because even seagull is pretty damn good look at the underdogs your mobile phone comes from China your iPhone, your latest iPhone your latest Pixel, your latest Google your latest Samsung it doesn't matter what it is they know what they're doing across there and when it comes to watchmaking they're doing it at a fantastic price point the only strange thing is the movement and where it comes from and it sounds like a well-endowed superhero Dan Dong Indeed, so this is a Chinese watch in its essence completely. It has a titanium case, it has a handmade guilloche dial, which is done in China, and it has a Chinese movement in it, which, as Ricky says, is made in Dandong. Now, this is a, a lioning peacock movement. Everything about this watch on paper really stacks up. 40 millimeter case in titanium, titanium bracelet, hand guilloche dial, as we've mentioned a few times, this movement in there as well. And I believe it's going to sell around about the 3,600 US dollar mark. So all in all, you're pretty much paying the price that you would probably pay for just a hand-done guilloche dial out of Switzerland. Comes with an extra strap and a few tools in there as well. 100-piece limited edition. I'm going to proffer that this is going to sell out pretty quickly. And this is probably going to be one of these brands that in a few years from now, everyone's going to kick themselves that they didn't get into a little bit earlier. It could be the new Ming. Who knows? If you like the aesthetic, definitely go for it. And one of the points Dave brought up there was this hand guilloche dial. And it turns out it takes over 30 hours to create the dial. And one slip, one wrong movement of the machine, and it's not an automated task. Someone has to be there to operate the wheel. One slip and it's ruined. It's a little bit like the whole problem with enamel dials. And that isn't down to perhaps a slip of the foot or the hand on the tooling. That's down to the enamel actually cracking at any point. So in a similar way, these things here, the yield rate is not fantastic. So when you look at the price point compared to what you get and the hand finishing and how much labor intensive work is included, 
I think it's a bargain. And probably by the time you hear this, it'll all be gone. But if you're lucky, jump on the website, have a look and grab one. If you like it, definitely dive on it. Those 100 pieces will not last long, especially at that price. Correct. And we have another listener email. Again, if you don't want to contribute to the website, but you want to tell us what you think of things, good or bad, drop us an email. That email address will be in the show notes and you can check that out in the YouTube description as well. I read the last one and Dave's going to kick himself because this one is a tome. You're not wrong. It's a monster. So forgive me if I'm not looking into your eyes if you're watching this on YouTube, but I'm going to have to read it because it's a long one. Subject, noon N 1837. Evening, folks. Top grade pod. Best watch content and banter, in my humble opinion. Only really listening to watch pods on the commute for the last three or four months, so I don't have your full back catalogue in my ears yet. Ricky, if I heard right recently, there might be a ponchong for a bit of black and turquoise. If so, I thought I'd point you to the noon official Origin N 1837 to check out. Not sure if you guys would have come across noon, but it sounds like you're always open to checking out new brands. I'll be honest, I only found out about it because I was looking for some noon hydration tablets and the algo threw me to the noon official website. Looks like they've historically done some interesting collabs. Most of their collection is not for me, but their Origin watches are actually pretty good. Not a great deal online or on socials about the brand. Escapement24 seems to like them though, but I decided to take a bit of a punt and sink some pounds into a Chrono and an N1837. I do just love a limited edition. And I have to say, they're a lot of fun and really pretty good. Just that we thought, I'd throw your way. I do not work for noon, by the way. Cordially, Dom L. Now that was very much a book that I just read. I've never heard of the brand, although I have heard of Noon Hydration Tablet, so I can see where that got to. Spelt N-U-U-N. Haven't even looked at this watch yet. Have you had a chance yet, Ricky, to have a look? I have. I went on the website, I had a look at this particular watch, and the mention of Nautilus plays in because it has a little bit of a look and a feel of perhaps a D1 Milano at the lower end and the Patek Nautilus 5711 at the higher end. It seems to be a kind of midpoint, mid-budget type watch. Obviously it's an automatic movement there, mechanical movement from Miota. They look pretty good. Haven't seen one in hand, but the colour scheme, the black and the turquoise, yeah, it's becoming more of a thing. And not just with the watch brands that we speak about on the show. I've seen this colour scheme popping up quite a few times going through the catalogue on the British Watch and Clockmakers website because they've got over 80, well, I think it's 81 or 82 brands now within the UK. And I like to keep abreast of things when I'm speaking to Catchy and the team there to see what's new. Yeah, turquoise and black is a thing. So perhaps, Dave, you could have a look at it or perhaps we can get in touch with the guys and see if they can send us one over to play with. But yeah, that was an absolute book that was sent in as an email. You're lucky you got that read on the show because usually we don't. And I thought I would just annoy Dave and get him to read the whole thing out and see how many mistakes he made. And you know what? He did good. Him and Ms. L, biscuits for you this week. Anyway, moving along. Yacht timers, bit of colour, another collab. I think this is your turn to take this one. I think I will. And this is a collaboration between Tag Heuer and Rowing Blazers. And we've had Eric Wind on the show. He's involved in some way, shape or form with the folks at Rowing Blazers. It started off with Seiko 5s, which is not an issue, not a problem. Didn't like the Seiko 5s personally. Didn't like the look of them. I didn't like the styling on that particular dial. Fast forward to today and this tag release and the colour schemes and the way that everything seems to just work. It almost looks like parchment printing paper, the way that the colours end up on the dial. It's got a grand Seiko vibe to it. I like it. I don't know if Dave will like it because it's very difficult to tell these days. He likes all kinds of weird and wonderful things. Well, you forgot a friend of the show, George Bamford, because technically this is the Rowing Blazers x George Bamford x Tag Heuer Carrera. So they've all got a little finger in this one. How can you forget George Bamford having a finger in it? Apparently he's very forgettable, especially when he works in a department store. But hey, that's a different story for a different time. I should love this watch. I like bright colours. I mean, the watch I'm wearing on this podcast this week is full of bright colours. I can't quite bring myself to like this one. I think it's got a bit too much white going on, weirdly. Just can't quite gel with it. I'm not the hugest fan of the Carreras as a watch anyway albeit it's not really something that offends me because it's relatively benign in its aesthetic. This one though, 
not for me. Really not a fan of the rowing blazers on the text of the dial round about the six o'clock area. Of all of the collabs that rowing blazers have done recently, I quite like the Seiko. Wouldn't be quite as harsh as you are about them. Okay, probably wouldn't buy one, but didn't mind them. The one that I liked the best that they did recently was the Rowing Blazers collab with Zodiac, which was the green dialed watch, which I think was maybe six to nine months ago, something like that. That was a cool looking watch. Really liked that one. This, it's a no from me. And on the basis that it's coming in at around about the 9,000 US dollar mark, it's got a bit of a premium over what you would expect to pay for a Carrera. Not a huge one to be fair, but Nonetheless, it's got a bit of a premium. I'm afraid it's a pass from me. Okay, Simon, it's a no from you. I like it. I think it's cool. And this is the only one that I think the logo actually works properly. I don't know if it's the size of the dial in the Seiko 5s where there's too much going on, but I do like this. And apologies, George, I forgot your name is attached to this because you do so much stuff. And when I do get a reply from you on WhatsApp, it's usually just one word. And it's, it's the correct word, but it's still one word. I like this. I think it's cool. And I think it was about a year ago. It was last November time, December time. I think that green one came out with Zodiac because, again, they're collaboration masters. This definitely has been the Get Along Gang episode. You know, you called me Simon earlier. When? He went, OK, Simon. Yeah, Simon, cool. Oh, Simon, cool, all right. Fucking, <laughs> that went over my head. A bit like my cum shot. And we're going to finish off with a Hanhart, a brand that we don't really speak about much on the show because we've only really had one to play with. And it was fantastic. It had lots of anodized colours on it. The colour scheme was very desert, khaki, that sand, that kind of beigey, coffee brown. Well, they're back as they have got something that is blue and it stands out just as much if not more because the colour scheme is far more vibrant. They have got the pushers that stick out so you can't miss them. Dave would absolutely hate being on his little mountain bike with those things digging into his wrist but we're here to talk about cool watches and I like this one. I think it's cool. Don't know if Dave does but he's going to tell us all about it now. This is a Hanhart Primus Fly Navy Chronograph Limited Edition. Two versions in a stainless steel case or a PVD black coated case. I can't decide I don't dislike it, but I don't love it. This is good value for money. A couple of price points, just under €3,000 and just over €3,000, depending on whether you go for the stainless steel or the black PVD case. Hmm, do I like it? It's very much I'm going to sit on the fence and get like little bits of wood sticking into my buttocks on this one. Certain facets of it I like, quite like the colours. The black PVD one I think does it more than the stainless steel one for me. Solita based movement, so solid workhorse. Seems to be a you know, pretty fair price for what you're expecting to get in terms of the fact that it's a chronograph around about the 3,000 euros. Very utilitarian, very tool watch orientated. This is a brand that's been around for a long time. Started in Switzerland, then just after the 19 hundreds clock ticked over they moved to germany they've been there ever since and they've had a heritage of making aviator watches and this one has a heritage that links it back to the kind of german naval aviation wings and to this day i'm going to have to divert to you to see what you think of it and then i will maybe make my mind up on this one i love it I told you that you don't listen you've got too much um reproductive matter in your ear canal so i like this i think it's cool i love the pushers on it i love the anodization i even love the little counterweight that you get on the seconds hand it's a cool watch if you like that look if you're trying to think about this because you're driving and you're not looking at the show notes because we always tell you to do that if you're driving you're at the gym and you're like what are these guys talking about what is this familiarity perhaps with another type of watch i would say like a graham watch perhaps or there's a brand and i can't remember the name of it very famous brand very famous design and it's a black watch and it has got the coloured almost like the Alan Silberstein colours on the side of it black with the yellow the red and the blue on the pushers French brand is it Lip? Lip correct Lip the French brand there we go you got it it's got the little round coloured kind of chronograph uh, buttons on it yeah in the primary colours that's correct Lip so this is a more T1000 Ed209 variation of that. So have a look in the show notes. If you like it, you like it. I'm going to get in touch with the brand and say send us one of the new ones over because I think it has been about three years since we last saw one in the flesh. But in the flesh, we have a ton of watches. It has been Christmas time here at Scottish Watches Towers over the last two weeks. 
As much as I have a Zodiac in the deck that needs to go back, we have a new watch from the limited edition to check out. We have a whole host of fossil watches. And they are doing really cool things with their automatics. I don't know if Mike at Zodiac has been infesting the brains in the R&D department over there. But since their R2-D2 watch around about May the 4th, their different Jedi watches, since then they've really come along in my estimation with what they're putting together. And the price point at around about €450, Euros, $450, it's incredible what you get value for money wise. And they stack up. They're very similar to Seiko 5s, if not even slightly better than the Seiko 5s. So stay tuned for more information on that. Follow us on Instagram, at Scottish Watches. Check the website, scottishwatches.co.uk and drop us an email, info at scottishwatches.co.uk. Anything else you'd like to talk about before we let these people on their way? Nope. Other than to say, if you're considering to buy, now's the time to act. Get your flight sorted out if you want to go because the tickets are out there and also for Dubai Watch Week all of the appointments for booking for seeing the different panels and such like are there as well. So if you're thinking about it now's the time to act before they're all booked out. And on the Dubai Watch Week front we have had Hin Siddiqui on the show back in 2021 and then last year just before Horology Forum 8 in New York. For people that don't know Dubai Watch Week is every two years. We were there two years ago. We cannot wait to get back this year we're already meeting up with some of the scottish watches team ralph is going to be there i think edward's going to be there even mark from new york is flying into dubai for a couple of days to spend some time with us so we're going to have a good old get together if you're traveling if you're coming along or even if you stay in the locale and you want to meet up we will be there pretty much the entire week and at least one of those days one of those nights we want to organize a scottish watches meet up with everybody and anybody it doesn't matter if you're a new collector it doesn't matter if you're traveling across you could be curtis from down south jumping on a plane taking some time off his work to come along and check out all these amazing creators that will be there i think most of the information is already out there but we will have Hind back on the show within the next few weeks to chat about what will be happening there, the panel talks, the discussions. But listen, just take our word for it. If you can go, go. Don't wait for everything to be announced. Just bloody go. It will be so worth it. Do you concur? I concur. Dave agrees again with something I've said. It's time to end the show on a high. These things never usually happen. They cannot be topped. So thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And we'll catch you guys again soon. <laughs>